And welcome to our online community. Thank you for watching. I'm glad you're here. So yes, we are talking about death in the afterlife, but I had so much fun preparing this talk. I, go figure. <laughs> Fun so yeah, it's a fun subject. So <laughs> let's jump in. Come back with me. It is July 8, 1741. July 8, 1741. You are sitting in a pew at First Church of Christ in Enfield, Connecticut. You are a British subject as American independence is 35 years away. The colonies and Britain are in the grip of what we have now come to call the First Great Awakening, which was a, a rage of religious revivalism that in this time frame, 1740 to 1750 or so, swept Britain and the 13 colonies. So as you sit there, theologian and pastor Jonathan Edwards walks forward, he ascends the pulpit and positions himself where, as my old reverend used to call it, you are four feet above contradiction. <laughs> He turns and he looks straight at you. He then tells you with utter certainty and knowing and conviction that there is nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of an angry, vengeful God. Ooh, that's <laughs> he then goes on to deliver the okay, you're right. He then goes on to deliver the rest of what has become known as one of the most famous sermons of the first great awakening. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Has anyone read it? Because I am who I am, I have it on my Kindle. <laughs> and I have read it. And it was a very apt title. He goes on to instruct the now terrified faithful that the God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. This is a sermon this guy gave twice, and possibly more. The vivid image Edward gave on that day, 277 years ago today, he gave it on July 8th, 1741, is that we are all sinners, we are all lost, we are all damned, and the only thing that prevents us from falling right now into the chasm of that fiery hell is the whim and the momentary pleasure of an angry and vengeful God. The visual he gives us, yeah, you're right, Kay. The visual he gives us is of a hand, the hand of God suspended over the gaping, mauling, burning mouth of hell, with us in the hand that can be withdrawn at any moment. And will be withdrawn if we don't accept the beliefs that he tells us to believe. He said, the use of this awful subject may be for awakening unconverted persons in this congregation. I don't know about you, but I think every person in that congregation would be pretty converted. That world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone, is extended abroad under you. There is nothing between you and hell but the air. It is only the power and pleasure of God that holds you up. Imagine that you're sitting in those pews. Just Think for a second that you are sitting in those pews and you are hearing this message from a learned pastor, from a well-known theologian, from somebody who has studied this stuff. The image of God, of your potential faith, would have an amazing impact on your life, on how you relate to God, right? On how you envision God, on what you think of yourself, and of your relationship to your fellow men and women. It would profoundly color how you feel about just about everything in your life. No one wishes to fall or see their loved ones fall into that pit. That is who that God is. That is who you are. So fast forward to today, July 8, 2018. While many in traditional Christianity and other Abrahamic faiths still believe that our options are salvation or hell, you will still hear that today, I have still heard that today, Many no longer do. Why? Our worldviews have opened up. Thanks to the gift of inner spirituality, we have received information and input and wisdom from other faith traditions. 
right? We just have a broader view than they do, but we still wonder. We still wonder what happens when we die. Where do we go? If even the image of going is a proper image, what happens when we die? I know that's why you came here today, because you thought I was going to tell you. I hope you're writing this down. I'm not. I don't know. Right? Now, I would be abashed and embarrassed at giving that answer, but the thing is, I am in very good company. None of you know. <laughs> Pastor and theologian Marcus Borg wrote, I am a committed Christian and a complete agnostic about the afterlife. He says, I use agnostic in its precise sense, one who does not know. Moreover, I know that I cannot resolve not knowing by believing. These are his quotes. Whatever we believe about an afterlife has nothing to do with whether there is one or what it is like. Isn't that true? We can believe whatever we want. We don't know till we get there. If getting is a proper image. I don't know that it is. We're going to talk about that. None of us know, and whatever we say about the afterlife is, based on, is not based on what actually happens. It may be based on belief, belief, hope, optimism, what we read, what our neighbors told us, our own life experience. It can be based on superstition. It can be based on all those things put together. Based on all those things and more, for me, I personally think that it is a bigger question than my little mind can wrap itself around. It just is. I don't know. And I'm okay in the not knowing. But I still have to believe something about it in order to move forward and formulate what I think about God and what I think about myself. But we don't know. As St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthians, it is what no eye has seen and no ear has heard. But even if we don't know, and even if we won't know, the question still matters to us. Christian mystic and theologian Richard Rohr, you know him, I talk about him a lot, I love Richard Rohr, has said that our attitude about death is our attitude about God. Think about that. Our attitude about death is our attitude about God. I will add that our attitude about death also reflects our attitude about ourselves. Right? Who we are, what we're doing here, our relationship with spirit. Think about that. Think about those unfortunates in the pews back in 1741. Didn't the fear that he was teaching impact their attitude about God and about themselves? I think it did. It had no option to. God was angry, judgmental, whimsical. They were broken and sinful and worthless. This attitude was not limited to colonial Puritans. As a young monk, Martin Luther was so terrified of God's judgment, he would sometimes confess for as many as six hours a day. Literally, he would. He would keep his poor confessor in that booth for as many as six hours a day. He would rack his brains for things that he had done wrong, sins he had committed, and then he would go confess them. But he, Because he thought there was no salvation unless there was total forgiveness and total confession. Finally, his exhausted teacher and confessor told him, Man, God is not angry with you. You are angry with God. Don't you know that God commands you to hope? His fear of this judgmental, angry, vengeful God arose from his image of that, of that God. And that is what made him angry. It, it impacted how he lived his life and how he approached his view of himself and his view of God. So these are the questions I want to explore today. It is not just an academic question, even though we don't know what's going to happen. Why is it not just an academic question? Because here at One World, each of us is on the journey to forge our own spiritual path, right? We don't normally think of it from the perspective of what happens after we die. But it's an important question, because what we believe about that impacts what we believe about ourselves. So I thought, let's take 20 minutes and think about it. Because what we do here is we don't have a fixed dogma, we don't have a fixed theology. We each create our own from the various wisdom traditions that we study. And this is an important question. I, I'm inviting you today to ask yourselves, what do you believe about what happens when you die? What does it mean of your view of God? What does it mean of your view of you? These are useful things to think about. And so that's what we're going to do today. So what does ancient wisdom teach? Because that's what the perennial wisdom is. We teach 
the mystical ancient wisdom from the world's different faith traditions. We've seen the Puritan spin on Christian teaching, but that's only a partial view. Traditional Christian theology remains that there is a heaven and there is a hell. Now, you're not going to get the hand of God over the burning pit image today, but you're still going to get the message. I've had friends get the message. I've had friends who are gay whose families have told them, you better change because if not, you are going straight to hell. And this was within the past two years. It's still a message that you get because it's still the theology that is taught. However, there are more and more Christians and followers of other Abrahamic traditions, primarily Judaism, who don't see it that way. They live in a theology which is closer to that that we normally teach, that heaven and hell are constructs that we make ourselves, right? Heaven and hell are right here. If I live in connection with the divine spark in me, if I live connected to source, if I live, as we've said in previous talks, in the flow, then I can create my own heaven here because I can remain connected with God. If not, if I separate myself, if I put up all the roadblocks to my own divinity, if I layer on so much stuff over my divine core, then I can put myself in hell right here and right now. I don't have to travel anywhere. That's what Jesus taught, isn't it? If you look at his sayings, the kingdom of God is within you. It's here. You don't have to die and go find it or die and show up in it. It's right here. You can find it and live it here. So. In that theology, let's say that we do, as I do, believe that theology. That we live out of our divine essence here. What does it look like after we die? How do these more traditional theological paradigms adapt themselves to a system where all of a sudden heaven and hell have relocated? Right? We're not looking to the future. You know, there's a sign on heaven and hell, we've moved. But oh my God, we're now next door to you, you know? So how does that work? How do we consider what happens after we die in that new paradigm? Well, let's go back to Marcus Borg, the Christian theologian and afterlife agnostic. He wrote, so there is an afterlife, and if so, what will it be like? I don't have a clue. This is Marcus Borg. But I am confident that the one who has buoyed us up in life will also buoy us up through death. We die into God. What more that means, I do not know. But that is all I need to know. He says we die into God. Isn't that a great image? It's a very different image. If we are in hell here, think about that. If we have placed ourselves in hell here by the way we have lived, what I personally believe is that it ends. And that when we make that transition, we are, all, we are, we are in perfect knowing and in perfect love and in perfect peace. If we have created heaven here, and it's never all one or the other, I mean, because we're not that, we're not able to make it all one or the other, but if we have lived with love and compassion, we find more of the same. We, we transition into a more perfect knowing of the fullness of spirits, love and compassion and acceptance and pure, unadulterated joy. That is what I believe. Based on what? Based on my life experience. Based on my personal relationship I've had with the divine, based on my study of the mystics whom I've read, based on studies of things that I've rejected. That's it. That's how you figure it out. Based on where your own heart leads you and what you feel is right. We all have a different truth about this. My hope today is that we will each consider it. I think questions like this are one reason that so many who follow the Abrahamic traditions have been tempted to go into the mystical aspects of those. Right? Because instead of just the belief about God, Jesus Christ, dogma we are supposed to accept, it is a personal relationship, it is personal experience that leads you to find your own truth. Religious historian Houston Smith, whose ideas were so influenced by Hindu mysticism, compared a human dying to, quote, a dewdrop slipping into the shining seas. Isn't that great? Yeah. A dewdrop slipping into the shining seas. We've seen other images, right? What is, the, what is one of the Hindu images? The wave coming out of the ocean and the wave coming back. And what was the image today? It was kind of like that today in one of the songs. It's like a drop of rain. Drop of rain. Yes, like a drop of rain flowing into the ocean. Yeah, those are the images we get. We are all part of the, of the one. And our individuation comes up and rises up and then stops. 
and goes back down. We're going to talk about that a little more in a second. If we come from a place of judgment and salvation, what does that mean for us in terms of how we live? I think it means we, we come from a place of ego, right? We come from a place of it's me. Why? Because I'm focused on avoiding hell for me. I'm focused on getting on that train to heaven for me. When I get there, the me that is me remains, right? If I'm in hell, I'm eternally punished, though, as me. If I'm in heaven, I'm rewarded as me. It still is a duality and ego-based paradigm, right? There's no merging. There's no oneness. There's no awakening to me being something else. That is the traditional Abrahamic teaching and the duality that comes from it. And the same is kind of similar in Islam. Um, in Islam, though, you are not judged based on whether you accept the prophet. You are judged based on your acts. But their descriptions of paradise and hell are very specific. And it is still a God who judges. I remember it's that duality. When my youngest son uh, was four, we were putting him in Holy Innocence, which is a private school, which was uh, it's his connected to the Episcopal Church. And so we were having an open house with a headmaster. And somebody asked, well, what do you teach them about God? What is your religious education? And the, and the guy said, well, we teach them that there is a God, and it's not them. <laughs> now, see, back then, everyone was like, oh, 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 that's great, that's great. Now I'd be like, well, why not? Don't teach them that. I don't want my son to learn that. I want to learn that it is him. But that's the dual view. That's the duality view. There is a God, and it's not you. How about those who believe in the view of Houston Smith, in the view of Marcus Borg, in the view that I have, which is that we, we return to the one? Well, I think our focus shifts. For one, our focus is not on the afterlife, is it? Our focus is not if I'm going to get rewarded or if I'm going to get punished. The focus is on how I'm doing here. How am I being an expression of God right here? How am I creating heaven or hell right here? The transition, of, the, the transition that happens at death is not a movement into judgment, but a movement into greater and clearer knowing as we return home. And that's what the perennial wisdom teaches. That's what the mystic traditions teach in all the faith traditions. They teach, and I find this so comforting and so enriching to me, that at the moment of death and in the afterlife, it's not a question of being rewarded or being punished so much. Of course, there are beliefs in karma, which I believe in, that there are intentional acts that create certain energies and those energies need to be balanced. And if you believe in multiple lives, then over the course of those multiple lives, those energies do get balanced. But at the same time, the perennial wisdom teaches that we are all being, right? We are mind and body expressing as us, but at the end, we are all of one being. Now, Rami Shapiro, you may not have noticed this, Rami Shapiro uses a great tool to illustrate this. And I brought this with me. This is a rope. Okay, he uses a rope. Because I'm 100% transparent, this is a leash. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but this rope, just stick with me here, this rope is ultimate reality. Right? This rope is God. Whatever you call it. Right? Okay. It doesn't change. This entire rope is ultimate reality. What happens at birth? When I am born, or when you were born, a knot is placed in this rope. Does the rope change? No. The rope has taken an individual form. This is the Melanie knot. It's me. It's my expression of this rope as me. Each of you, each thing, each animal, each being has a knot. They look different. This is someone else's knot, right? But it's the same rope. At birth, a knot is created that is us. It's the individual expression of this rope as us. They don't look alike, but it's all the rope. It's all the same rope. What happens at death? The knot is released. Is the rope that was the knot gone? No, it's still here. It's just a different form. At death, we just return to the rope. But it's the same rope. It's the same substance. Nothing has changed. Isn't that a great image? That's 
the perennial wisdom. That teaches us that at death and after death, we just return where we came. Jesus said in the book of Thomas that the beginning is the same as the ending. Because where we come from is the same place to which we return. And I'm not even going to use the word going. When the Indian sage uh, Ramana Maharshi was dying, his, uh, his disciples were gathered around him, begging him not to go. And he looked at them and he said, where would I go? The answer is, you don't go. Rami Shapiro says that when you answer the question, where am I going, there are two answers. One is somewhere, and the other answer is nowhere. Right? If we believe we are of this rope, when we die, the answer is we are going nowhere. We are just back to being the rope. So as we leave here today, think about that. Think about what your answer is. Are you going somewhere or are you going nowhere? And what does that mean in terms of your walk on this earth here? Because if we are the rope, we don't have to wait until the moment of death to know it, right? We are invited by spirit into a, an unfolding awareness of our nature as the road all through life. That's what our spiritual practices are for. That even as we are here, we can become more and more aware that we are just a temporary knot in an ongoing and eternal rope and fabric of creation. So let's take these thoughts into meditation.